Thank you for joining us at uh, Beer Fish Fanatics. And this episode is actually brought to you by Whisker Seeker Tackle. So make sure you guys go to whiskerseeker.com for all your catfishing gear. Enjoy the episode, guys. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Beer Fish Fanatics. This is Grandy with Mob Pop Fishing. We have is kit with the fishing kit youtube channel and today we're gonna keep it local uh we we love supporting local uh you know fellas fishermen and people who are are starting uh their own thing whether it's on youtube facebook group all that good stuff so um we actually i think we've been wanting to have the gentleman on for a while we just got kind of crazy busy with life and everything so um with no further ado we have mr uh, Derek wilkins of 515 fishing how you doing today sir i'm fantastic guys thanks for uh giving me the chance to talk with you a little bit about fishing it uh it's always a fun opportunity yeah yeah well yeah for sure for sure Thank you for uh, just spending the time and uh, just, you know, like I said, just shooting the shit with us. So um, <laughs> first off, got to say a quick shout out to Kelowna Brewing. Uh, I'm doing the Kelowna Classic today, guys. Uh, it, it, I'm doing the light lager because uh, my wife has touched my belly. She's like, dude, this beer fish fanatic is getting to you, brother. So I, I, I got to take it a little bit lighter, man. What do you got, Kit? Uh, I got one I never had before from Kelowna. And that is the Lubricator. <laughs> <laughs> It's oh, a do- Doppelbach lager, and it's a it's a doozy 7.5% alcohol. Yes. All right. You're going to be uh, nice and lubricated after that one, kit. That's great. Uh, so. And then, Derek, what do you got down there, man? A uh, little New Glarus tonight, a little Wisconsin beer. This is the uh, the Wisconsin Belgian Red, so it's like a, a cherry. They, they put like a pound of cherries in each bottle is what they claim. Hmm. So, uh a little bit more of a fruity one, but they say they put a, a pound of cherry. That, that's what they claim. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the logistics of that and how that works. That's but a, uh, yeah, that's a lot of cherry to be putting in <laughs> one beer, man. Holy yeah. crap! Yeah. That's, so right. I don't. It does taste like cherries, though. So. <laughs> I, I hope so. Cheers, cheers. I mean, it's probably a little right. bit different than their cow. Oh, yeah, nice and light. But oh yeah, just to give everybody a heads up, we will be. I, I think we were talking. We will be uh, doing an episode and uh, down at Kaluna Brewing sometime in the next couple of weeks or months. Uh, we're trying to get out there and um, you know them supporting us. So we're we're definitely going to swing by out there. And, and I hear nothing but good stuff about their uh, food there at the restaurant. So we're definitely going to swing by the brewery. So we get that opportunity on that. Um, but it's springtime in Iowa. Uh, I'm sure you're getting out there. I mean, probably more than myself. Um, but you know, t- tell us a little bit about yourself, Derek. Tell us a little bit about you know five one five fishing. You don't mind, man? Yeah, yeah. So um, I do a little bit of everything. I think the one thing that makes um, my my angling style a little bit unique maybe is I'm not a specialist of of you know one particular species. I don't target one thing throughout the year. Um, I do a little bit of everything depending on the time of the year, what's hot. And, uh, I think the reason for that is I just, I really respect the different types of fish and they all have a different kind of feel to them. Um, and they all kind of have their, their, you know, their ups and downs and stuff. And so I just really like experiencing that, uh, as far as five on five fishing goes. Um, I think mainly known for the Facebook group at this point. Um, it's, a, it's a group, uh, we're a little over 5,000 members now, um, we've got a lot of local groups and, you know, they're all great. And so it's never uh, a competitive thing. You know, everybody's kind of got their groups that they like. I think the one thing with uh, 515 fishing is I just, I'm always trying to keep it fresh and, and keep new things on the page. Um, and we're always trying to just do some different things so that it doesn't become stale. Um, we've done some different raffles in the past that, you know, we have a, a, a select group of people on there really seem to like um we've done a swap meet last year we're doing one again this spring we've done a seminar series uh kind of like you guys would do with your podcast we did that uh via live facebook and we had richard grimes do that for us last month so we just do, just trying to do a lot of different projects and and get the name out there and and, and just kind of help each other out uh the one big thing too for for me is that we're a family friendly you know page so there's not 
there's not a lot of, you know, cursing and, you know, hate back and forth, you know, most of that gets cut pretty quick. Um, I guess the other thing that makes this group a little unique is it's, it's a one man show. Um, and it is getting bigger and that makes it a little bit more difficult to keep tabs on it. But I feel like by having it being a one man show, I, I can control that a little bit easier, um, versus having multiple people look out for stuff. Um, I am doing some other little projects right now. I've got uh, the 515 website's got a blog on there for people that have checked it out. And I just wrapped up uh, getting my insurance settled this week for doing some guiding. And so um, I'll be honest with you and tell you that that is uh, a new venture and I'm a little anxious. Uh, I'm excited, but I'm a little nervous as well because anytime you now have a client in your the pressure is to get people on fish, you know, um, and you know, you can fish, but it, there's still that pressure of now you're on the clock and money is coming your way and putting people on fish. So I'm excited about that, but we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes, you know, especially in, in central Iowa. Nice. Is there, is there any particular species you're going to target with that? Cause I well, know a lot of guys, they're kind of specialized with like, um, yeah. like two or three species. Yeah, no, I think I think the biggest thing for me will be kind of based around the different spawning times, um, you know, with the crappie spawn coming up here soon, it makes it an easy shore targeting fish. And so I, I think I, my focus is going to be more on techniques and, and places to target these fish and, and get it on that way. Um, and I think my rates reflect that. Uh, I think the rates I'll have out there reflect not only that, my guiding experience and the fact that we're in central Iowa. All right. I mean that there's really no way around it is our, our fishing as far as consistency goes, is just not the same as the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Now, do we have trophy fish? Yeah, we do, but you're not going to go out there and, and get the numbers, you know, on a regular basis, like you do in some of those other spots. So we'll see. I'm, I'm looking at crappie in the spring. I'm, I'm hoping to do, uh, some drifting for cats there in the summer. That's, that's mm. always a blast. Um, and I think, I think um, I'm anticipating that ice fishing will probably be the busiest for me just because I know there's a lot of people out there that don't want to go out and buy all the gear, but they want to have that experience. And I'm a big believer that if you've never gone ice fishing, the best advice I give somebody is go out with somebody that has done it before and can put you on the ropes and has the gear and just can kind of show you if it's something you're going to really like or not. And so I'm anticipating that that will probably be my niche is, is ice fishing. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I always tell like people trying to get into ice fishing. I tell them the same thing, like the best way to get started is just go with somebody that knows what they're doing, has all the gear. And then from there you can kind of gauge, you know, if this is what you really want to do, or then you can see, you know, what, what you really need. Yeah. Cause it's, I mean, it's expensive to just take that leap of faith. If you've never done it before and go, Hey, I'd like to try ice fishing and, and to really have a, a, a high quality shot at it, unless you're just going to a small farm pond. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it takes, it takes a pretty penny to get started out there. So why not pay, you know, a small fee and go out with somebody and, and see what happens and, and go from there. Cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Hey, I'm just wondering, how, how did you get into fishing? Cause I, we normally, sometimes we'd never get a chance to really ask our guests, like, how did you get into fishing? Um, what about, what is it about fishing that you love? And, and, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of story that built you to the, you know, the fisherman you are today? Um, I think my story is probably similar to a lot of us. And the fact that I had a grandfather that took me out as a kid, uh, I think that's where a lot of us started is just going with, uh, you know, a parent, a family member, and just enjoying that, that time outside. Um, for the longest time for me, that, that's kind of what fishing was, is just a social event, either with family or, or friends. You know, if it is in high school, I was uh, going out with some buddies and targeting largemouth and, and doing the whole Iowa pond thing. You know, that's where a lot of my spent was going to the ponds and, and crappie, bluegill, bass, that, that kind of thing, rinse and repeat. Um, and then somewhere between high school and college, it became uh, somewhat of a challenge to me to where I, I, I had that intrinsic motivation to get better. Um, and so I started going more by myself uh, because I felt like I could do more things by myself and be more experimental and try new places. Because um, one thing I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like no matter what it is, and maybe it's just because I'm competitive, but if I'm going out with a buddy, and I know that we're not, I mean, we're, we're just going out casually fishing. 
there's still like that competitive part in the back of my mind that if Kit catches two fish, I all of a sudden need to change something up so that I'm catching fish too. Um, whereas if I'm going by myself, like I might just throw tube jigs all day because I, that's not something I normally do, but I want to try and get better at it. But if Kit's out there with me, I'm taking that tube jig off and I'm throwing on whatever Kit's got on, you know, <laughs> to get those fish. So that's, that, yeah. that's one thing I like about going by myself. Cheers on that one. I, I do yeah. the same thing. And then, and then speaking of competitiveness, uh, if you ever get a chance to go, when you go fishing with us, uh, we definitely bring the beers because I always put a beer on the line. I always freaking, I, I lose about 90% of the time against this guy, but the, the one, you know, the, the 10% that I do win, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't let him live it down. No, he doesn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you better bring your A game if you're going to fish against me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I like to hear, but no, I don't know. And I like, I like to, uh, I mean, Big Creek is obviously the the backyard lake um, that I like to fish, but I kind of like to travel anywhere between an hour, an hour and a half within the metro because there's just a lot of bodies of water out there that people don't fish mm -hmm. um, that get overlooked. And I think there's a lot of nice fish that people, you know, overlook out there and it gives you a chance to get out there where there's less pressure. So. Oh well, yeah, for sure. I think an hour, hour and a half, it's, it's kind of far, but it's not terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, especially during the summer, you know, you could, I'm, it might be a stretch if you got kids and stuff, but to make that trip after work is, is feasible. Unlike, you know, like some, some places like his uh, brother-in-law's out in Colorado, they got to drive far just to go fishing, like way out of the city, hour, two hours. I guess two hours isn't that much longer than an hour and a half. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. But, but, you know, they, they have a lot of pressure there. So that's why they have to go further because, um, where they're from, they live in Denver, Colorado, and a lot of the local spots that, uh, as soon as everybody hears about, you know, it's a bite right there locally, it's done. The pressure there is ridiculous. They say, so they, they, they typically drive, um, very far actually sometimes they drive six hours to go to another state and just to fish we're, we're lucky i think in a way because i was got like you were saying i mean we have an abundance of bodies of water just within one hour of, of central iowa i really think there's a, a ton of places that i probably never even heard about or even tried yeah. so well especially when you you're open to different types of fish you know i know right now um walleyes are or they're kind of like the hot topic right i mean i feel like everybody especially this time of year they want to go catch walleyes and, and there's nothing wrong with that um but it does limit you a little bit when you're targeting one fish um and where you go and the different pressure spots and uh, i think a lot of people beat themselves up because they're not catching walleye right now um but the fact of the matter is they're one of the tougher fish to catch i mean it, don't, it doesn't really matter what time of year it is they're just a little bit more of a finicky a fish, you know? And so for somebody that's uh, more of a casual angler or, angler or a weekend angler, I think uh, it's easy to beat yourself up over not catching a bunch of walleye in the spring. I don't know. Facebook pictures show everybody catching walleye, but me, <laughs> it must, I don't know. I must be going to the wrong spot though. Cause I'm just like, Hey man, everybody keeps posting all these monster walleyes in central Iowa. I'm like, can somebody show me a spot please? <laughs> I don't know. You, it might cause some drama if somebody shows yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of um, uh, walleyes, is it targeting right now? What like what's your fish species right now? It has been um, basically since ice out. I mean, I, I had a couple trips for the ice out cats because I feel like that's always fun and that's a brief window, um, and it's a good change up. You know, when you're not going walleye fishing because um, I can only speak for myself, but there's there's skunk days um and it just is what it is when I, you're spring walleye fishing you'll go and you'll have a nice day you'll go and, and maybe catch a few and you'll feel like you're a really good angler and you know what you're doing and then you'll have a three-day cold streak and you won't catch crap so mixing it up with the the ice out channel cat is is fun but i would say predominantly right now yeah it has been um walleye and maybe maybe pike uh on the occasions i can get up and fish the iowa river a little bit more um I, I love pike just because they're so mean, kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, wipers and stuff like that. Um, the crappie is right now, you know, when they're still kind of in that, that transition time, I like, I like to wait till they get up there closer to shore and then just smash them. You know, there's easy pickings. Yeah. What do you yeah. think? I mean, what do you think about, what is it about central Iowa and fishing? Um, 
what I guess you say what differentiates us from other states or other locations? I'm just curious. What do you, do you feel that we're different from anybody else? Pros, cons. I know there's, you know, we don't have the huge, huge monsters of, you know, specific uh, species or anything, but I, I mean, I don't know. To me, I feel like we have a, a good variety of fish, but I mean, what do you really yeah. do think that it differentiates us from like, let's just say Chicago or, you know, Kansas or Illinois, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's a tough question. Not having, not being like, um, a biologist in the area, I guess my assumptions would be the number of natural body of water, uh, bodies of water that we have. And, you know, you think about when you talk about like Chicago, Milwaukee, that area, you, you got the great lakes and those, those larger ri river systems that feed into those and, and the number of forage sources. And you even think about like the Dakotas with the, uh, the sloughs and the freshwater shrimp, um, seems like our forage source is shad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, shad and, and maybe some, some insect larvae and stuff like that. Um, the other thing too, like with Iowa is the water clarity is, is one that gets brought up a lot, how that affects, you know, fish reproduction. I, I can't really say, I mean, there's the debate about walleye in our river systems seems to be a never ending conversation on, on the fishing groups, whether or not they actually reproduce. So I, I still couldn't tell you if they do or they don't. Uh, I have no idea because one person will come out and say they do because I talked to this DNR officer and they said that they do. And then somebody else will say, well, I talked to this one and they said that none of them do, you know? So I, I think that's tough. I, I think the one nice thing though with Iowa is to your point, the variety uh, that we have. And I know we were talking about wipers a little bit, you know, before we got started, I, I think that is maybe one of the highlights of, of central Iowa, you know, anywhere an hour, uh, north or south of the Metro, uh, there's some pretty good wiper fishing. And I, I don't want to say that's unique to central Iowa, but I feel like central Iowa maybe has some higher numbers than some of those other areas that we mentioned. Yeah. I feel, I feel like, um, in our area, they stock it pretty, pretty extensively. It seems to be like the number of one fish that stocks. Uh, I guess aside from walleyes, walleyes would probably be number one. How about catfish? Mm -hmm. Do they? Yeah, channel cats though. Channel cats too, right? No? Yeah, I don't. I don't think they stock them in the sheer numbers. I think they oh. just stock bigger fish and less yeah. of them. Gotcha. Yeah, every year. Yeah. Well, we'll have Iowa DNR here on soon again, so we'll, we can <laughs> we can ask we'll, we'll ask him and we'll just drill the shit out of him, Kit. Yeah. <laughs> He'll be like, "All right, you nailed it on the head, Kit. Thanks." <laughs> no i don't i don't claim to know everything about fishing because i am not I'm, I'm not a biologist i'm just talking out of my ass <laughs> one bad thing i feel like having fished so much more seriously over the last i don't know 15 years or so is i feel like my love of largemouth bass has decreased every year and it feels <laughs> bad saying that being an iowa boy uh you know with ponds and stuff but it just it's just not, I don't know. It just doesn't do it for me much anymore. You know, like, do I still get a rise out of catching a, a five or six pound bass off of top water? Yeah. That's still fun. I mean, it is, but I just, it just doesn't do it for me anymore. You know? And I feel bad saying that because I start to feel like a snob, you know, like one of those fish snobs. Cause I've got, I got some buddies that are from uh, Northwest Iowa and Minnesota and they're just, they're walleye snobs. I, there's no way around it. That's all they want to catch is walleye. And if they catch, a big wiper they just you know scoff at it and throw it back or they catch a catfish and they're like oh that's junk all they want is walleye i, I feel like that has become me for a large mouth and I, I feel a little bit bad admitting that uh this don't feel, don't feel bad <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> it's okay to talk down on bass <laughs> you, you're on the right podcast to, to say that because right. you get you, smallies the, though smallies are good I'm, I'm 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 game with smallies i don't have a problem with them i just the large mouth the greenbacks you know just not don't do it for me. I, I feel like bass, uh, other than bluegills, they're probably the lowest barrier of entry when it comes to fishing. Yeah. Because yeah. they're they're yeah. like they're they're really accessible. And I think it was Jeff Capasco that said, like, you know, they're not they're easy for kids to handle because mm -hmm. they don't have like yep. sharp spines and they don't have teeth, so they can't really tear you up. You know, a little fish could just grab it and then they'll be okay. And they're stocked everywhere. So right. I think other than the bluegill, they're probably the most common fish we have. So the tough thing for me is, so as I run um, Urbandale High School's fishing club, and so a lot of the kids, um, 
our, our bass anglers, you know, they're throwing their bait casters and they're watching John B and they're doing you know, <laughs> Guggen, Guggen squad stuff. And, uh, so they want to go catch a uh, big largies. And I just, they always ask me, well, why didn't you want to catch largemouth? And I said, well, it, it sounds really insensitive, but I just think they're kind of stupid. <laughs> <You know? laughs> hey, they're green um, carp. See, there's a reason why they call it the green carp, right? Uh, just, there, there's so many bass baits out there in my mind because there's so many ways to catch them because they're not real picky, you know, like mo most days out of the year, you can go and find a little corner of a pond, throw a couple baits out there and the chances of you catching a bass are pretty high. So I'll end my rant on, on large mouth there. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, don't feel bad <laughs> around me. <laughs> Just tell those high school kids that listen to our podcast. They'll be like, Hey, we should try catching wipers and catfish and stuff more often. And they can, they can get some tips from us. So, Granted, we don't have the Gooden guys on here. We tried, <laughs> yeah. tried, but I, I don't know. I, res I, I still respect those, uh, those like top level anglers that you know oh, they're yeah. they're all into the tournaments and stuff because that's yeah. that's a whole different ball game. I, yeah, I agree. I, I think um, oh. once you get into a tournament, um, it's it. Yeah, like you said, they they it's not just going out there just to catch fish. They they're targeting size. The amount of, you know, just the amount, they, they know what they're doing. And it's different. Well, and going on a big lake and catching bass is way different than going to a farm pond in Ankeny and catching yeah. bass. Very true. That, that takes, yeah. Planning decision. Oh man. It just when we had all, a lot of the tournament anglers we had in our podcast, I mean, just the stuff that they go through and how they plan and prep for it. Um, it's, it's pretty intense just to kind of hear what they go through. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So nothing bad about large mob, but I, w we agree with you a little bit though. Sometimes it's, it's overrated here and there. I, I will say that I caught two bass over 20 inches through the ice this season. And that was like fun. I ain't gonna lie. Oh, yeah. I was, um, I was at one of our favorite lakes. I won't name names, but, uh, it's one I know you both have been to for ice fishing and it's got Wally in it. And the very first fish of the day comes in and cameras it. And I'm convinced that this is a nice walleye and you get it up and it's a, I don't know, probably an 18 inch bass. And it was just utter disappointment. I mean, <laughs> it's better than, than not catching anything on the ice. I, I know I'm, I'm being a bass snob right now. <laughs> Have you ever eaten a bass? Let's let's go down that hole. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I have, and I have no interest in eating large mouth again. <laughs> okay. Really? Okay. Well, I mean, are they they're edible? They just, I don't. I, I guess the thing for me is when you have walleye, crappie, and perch, why keep a bass? Agreed. I don't. I don't know. That that's just kind of my. My two cents on it. I feel like I can go catch a ton of perch through the winter and, and catch a lot of crappie throughout the year, uh, sprinkling some walleyes throughout that time, and I'm I'm in good shape. So no, I I agree with you. It's not the greatest eating fish. It's edible, like you said, uh, but we are we are in Central Iowa where, like you were saying, we got crappies, which I still believe is the best eating fish. Uh, and then you got walleyes, like you said, you can't go wrong. Perch, you can't. I mean, it's, it's catfish. Hey, you just can't go wrong. And, and I agree with you. It's definitely not on the high totem pole for eating. Um, but that was, that was a hole that Kit wanted to dig. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm just glad uh, your feelings don't get hurt. Like when, if somebody eats bad, oh, yeah. I'm going there. I'm going there. <laughs> if I get hungry enough, I've got, I've got the aquarium behind me. He's got a few fish in it. I'll just take one of them out of there. Yeah. So. I, wait, wait, yeah. I was actually uh, looking at your aquarium. I seen a bluegill. A perch, yep. yep. A bullhead, four of them. Four bullheads. Mm -hmm. What else you got in there? Holy oh, got a kit! Your eyes are freaking uh, dope, man. <laughs> yeah, right. They're pretty good. Uh, got two crawfish in there, um, a green sunny, and believe it or not, I had a a sucker in there this morning, and right now he's missing in action, and uh -oh. so I'm not uh -oh. sure. <laughs> not sure what happened. Uh, cause he was probably about five inches and I'm not thinking these bullhead are big enough to eat him, but he's nowhere to be found. So I'm, I'm hoping he didn't like flop out somewhere on the bar and he's like, 
decaying somewhere. I haven't uh, found. Well, haven't you'll found smell. It. You'll smell them soon enough if that's the case, man. But they are cool to watch. I mean, um, it is kind of cool to watch the the behavior of them. You know, in the evenings and stuff like that. So uh, I like I like having them, and it saves me money from buying the tropical fish. Yep, mm. I agreed. Um, and then speaking of like like you know keeping fish and everything, uh, I. I, fishing kid myself we did a podcast yesterday uh and thank you for him for you know informing me because i had no idea about shad um you can't transport them and you can't raise them and breed them and stuff right i you're talking to a guy who's like man yeah you know you can keep bait fish right no you know because you know fishing kid was telling me no you can't transport them. you can't i i don't you can't know keep I, bait fish you just can't keep shad see, not live shad not live but that's bait fish right well, yeah, Benno's bait fish. But you, you, just can't, you can't transport live shad. They've got to be dead. They have to be. Okay, so you can transport them dead. Is that correct? Yeah. Then? Yeah, but if you're like, let's say you're on the boat out at Big, let's just use Big Creek as an example, mm -hmm. and you're catfishing and you uh, see pools or pockets of shad. I mean, you can throw your cast net and, and use those. I mean, right? I mean, right, kid? I mean, you can use those. You know, right there on that body of water, you just can't transport them live. I don't even think you're allowed to have them alive on that body of water. Really? Okay. Yeah. So, like, yeah, just keep, keep having them alive in your car is just taking it a step even further. Okay. See, I, I didn't know. If to, and he was telling me, he's like, no, you can't have them live. I'm like, what do you mean you can't have them live? And he's like, dude, you can't have them alive. They, like, they kill off lakes just to get rid of shad. Yeah. Like, case in point, Easter, like, they're, they're going to actually, they're going to start draining it. Uh, I don't know when they're starting, but before the summer starts again, then they just you talking about Easter or a quabby or a quabby. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm a like, quabby. I swear, I like Easter. Didn't they just rebuild the whole thing? Yeah. Well, like, okay. yeah, yeah, they just redid Easter Lake, but yeah. now this summer they're gonna do a quabby. Oh, really? And, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, I, yeah, I used... there's some nice fish in there, man. There's some nice fish in the quabby. Yeah, that's uh, I caught uh last one of my last ice fishing trips. I caught a. Like a 14 and a half inch crappie and uh, like a 20, 21 inch bass, something like that. Good job, Kit. Now you're making everybody who listens to this going down there. Hey, if you want to eat bass, they're going to drain the lake <laughs> and they're not, they're not going to move any fish because oh, they man. don't want to risk uh, transporting yeah, they, uh, the shad. They so actually the took, they took the limits off there. Like you can actually keep, I think as many as you want um, now because they are draining it. Wow. Oh, did they, did they lift the re restrictions That's already? Uh, that was my understanding. Yeah. Well, because last time I talked to Jeff, like last month, he said they haven't lifted uh, restrictions yet, and they so, wouldn't do it until, until like right before they're gonna start draining it. But I don't know if they start draining yet, draining it yet or not. Sure. Interesting. They're draining, uh, I think Hooper as well, right? Yep, they're heard. doing Hooper as well. Wow. Okay. Is it's because of the shad though, kit that that's the reason, or? Well, the shad is one of the main reasons for Easter. I don't think the shad are in Hooper. And, and they're also going to work on the dam, I think. Okay. So they're just, I, I, yeah, it makes sense for them to tackle multiple projects at once. True. But well, like I said, man, shout out to you for, for letting me know about that. Cause no, seriously, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm assuming uh, a lot of our listeners from central Iowa, they probably don't know that. You know what I'm saying? That hey, if, if you can keep Shad alive for more than ten, five minutes, then uh, you're, you're <laughs> no, maybe, no, I shouldn't say, <laughs> Maybe you you deserve to be able to keep that fish with you, but no, no, I ain't gonna say. It. Very true. They're pretty fragile. Yeah, basically, you you throw them in a net, put them in a bucket of water. Two minutes later, you look back in there, they're all dead. It's true. You have to really be trying to keep them alive. All right, I'm gonna grab another beer. It okay. is tough. It is tough that they they do ruin. You know, especially the small bodies of water pretty quick. I know there's some Ankeny ponds now that even have um, a lot of shad in them just from people, I think, you know, transporting bait and stuff like that back and forth or mm -hmm. dumping, uh, transporting fish, you know, whether that's from Big Creek or others, you know, Sailorville and, and just transporting fish to a pond and, and somehow, you know, shad and, or eggs or whatever get in there. And uh, we've gotten into some of the ponds in Ankeny over the wintertime. You just see big pockets of them. You know? Dude, and they're huge. Yeah. The, like some of them in Ankeny, I'm like, man, it's like a 10 inch shad, 12 yeah. inches. We saw it. Yeah. All right, I want to grab another beer. You guys go ahead and grab another beer if you want to, real quick. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I'm okay, actually. <laughs> I gotta wake up early. 
This episode was helped brought to you by our newest sponsor, Kelowna Brewing Company. They're a brewery out there in Eastern Iowa. So if you're in the area, make sure to stop by Kelowna and check out their brewery. Great food at the restaurant there, great beer, obviously. If you're in the Midwest, check out any high V's. I believe they carry the six packs and they have different types of flavors. So you guys are gonna wanna, you know, definitely try that out. And I think throughout this whole process, Fishing Kid and myself for Beer Fish Fanatics, we're gonna be doing some giveaways here and there. If you guys can go ahead and tag us here and there with your Kelowna beer. So other than that, enjoy the episode guys. All right, I am back and I'm doing the, cause I think you did this one, right kid? That, uh, is it the double night vision? Yep, yep. I've, yeah. I've, I've done that one twice. Yeah, I'm going to try. I haven't tried it. This is my first time trying it. So shout out again at Kelowna Brewing. What is, uh, what is a double night vision? It is a Belgian style ale, a double. <laughs> Holy nice. crap. It's 7.6. I keep forgetting. Holy. Well, yeah. I'm going to sleep good tonight. <laughs> these are, these are beer for grown ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just joking. People could drink whatever beer they want. Yeah, all right. Yeah. We, we, were, we were drinking Bush Lights and Coors Light last night. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just so our listeners or yeah, people are watching. Yeah, we, uh, Fishing Kid and myself, we we're kind of, we, we did a, uh, a podcast with um, River Certified. I'm pretty sure he probably released. I don't know when he's going to release it. But, yeah, we were drinking some <laughs> some Iowa golden uh, beer there. He's just like, nope, you, you're drinking with us. So you're drinking whatever I have. <laughs> yeah, he, he, Light beers, light beer to me, honestly. What's your? Uh, I guess you said what's what's your goal this year, man? Um, in regard, Derek, for fishing wise, is, do you have any goal? Do you set goals and stuff? Because I, I talked to a lot of people. Some people are like, yeah, this is my target. This is what I'm going to do this year. My goals and stuff. Do you have anything set for for open water this year for spring, summer, fall, or anything like that? Yeah, um, I, I feel like every year it's always nice. It's nice to have a goal. I mean, it doesn't mean you're gonna meet it or anything like that but getting getting a a walleye over 25 has been the goal the last two seasons um there's been there's been some real nice fish pulled out this spring Uh, i just have not been fortunate enough to get one of those monsters um i've had some nice i've had some nice fish you know the biggest biggest one so far this spring has been 19 which is a very respectable you know walleye Uh, it's a nice eater um but there's something about having those pre-spawn pigs, man. It's, that's a pretty cool feeling. Um, and the other, the other one would be to get a, a big flathead. And, and I guess my goal, my goal would be probably, you know, in the fifties would, would be a goal. Um, Ooh, wow. <laughs> I, I, I've had, well, the, th- the thing is like, you know, I, I wanted to do that last summer too. And I just, I just need to dedicate myself more to it. Um, Corey did a really good job of, kind of showing people how to do that last year, Corey Weaver and, and trying to find a big flathead and, and just kind of the, the trials and tribulations and the effort you have to go through if you're trophy hunting and you want to kind of stay away from um, the city dams area. And so that, that's something I want to do is I want to spend more time out, you know, in, in the evenings and on the sandbars and stuff like that and, and get one of those, those big uglies. That'd be kind of cool to, to get one of those and hold it up. So I, I would say that would be my my goals for the season. Yeah, and if people are listening, and wondering who who Corey Weaver is. He's the uh, owner of JB Fish Sauce. Um, I actually did an interview with him on on uh, my pop fishing channel and everything. He's a really cool guy. But you're right, what he did last year um, on social media, so just so people were knowing uh, what Derek was talking about, was he he actually kind of uh, what do you say? He he recorded his daily or his fishing journey, you know, journal, I guess he did like a journal almost. It felt like, uh, on social media that he was going to try a catch, a uh, you know, flathead. It was, it was pretty cool. I mean, he, he struggled, but then it was kind of cool to see how he progressed and learned stuff and asked people and, and just got better at it. And he finally caught that. So that was pretty cool. I, yeah, you're right. Shout out to him. Uh, cause I was watching his stuff too. I was like, dude, that's that pretty cool. That's pretty badass to see him do that. No, he, uh, Cause he, I mean, Corey could have very easily went to a few of those hot spots, you know, where, where a lot of people go and there's just more of those big fish. Um, mm-hmm. But he was pretty passionate about, you know, wanting to find his own spots and try different little nooks and crannies. And like you said, you got, you kind of got to see the struggle <laughs> uh, and seeing the, the pictures and hearing about it and stuff. And I think 
anybody that's a, a flathead diehard could tell you, oh yeah, that's that's just the reality of being a flathead fisherman. You just it is what it is, you know. You get a fish, and that's a good night. Um, so it was really cool just to see that progress of him go throughout that and and start to get bigger fish, bigger fish, bigger fish, and kind of see that reward pay off and kind of shows the why people do it, you know. True, very true. What's your goals, Grandy? Me? Yeah. Um, I do want to beat my PB uh, crappie, and PB crappie was 15, uh, 15, 7, 5, 15 points. Damn, yeah. that's, that's a pretty good size. It's, it's, oh. um, it was, ra- dude, this is the thing. I didn't even know that was that big because it was a couple years ago, and I was fishing with my friend uh, Magoo, and, and I caught it. I was just like, hey, it's, it's a You didn't think crappie. a 15-inch crappie was that big? I don't know. I, crazy? I was like. It was a 15.75. I measured it. And he's like, dude, that's a freaking monster. I was like, oh, but I, I would like to beat that. Uh, and then I, I, I want to be able to catch, um, I want to, I want, I want to catch a nice kayak, uh, catfish on my kayak fish, you know, since I, I finally upgraded, I don't know if we told anybody on our, our, our podcast yet, but I finally upgraded this year. I got, I, I went to the pedal kayak. Did we, did we talk about that at all, Kit? recently did i say it? okay no, no we talked about it on the river certified oh yeah podcast. so so yeah so so derek i i i upgraded to you know watching him being you know la di da da hands-free fishing i was like yeah i i i have to do it are you um, a, are you a hobie boy now oh hell no <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's not that cool I, i'm not oh whatever no i i i got a native uh propel uh, right. uh Slay, slayer yeah and yeah, I, I I just want to catch a catfish on that sucker just to say I caught a catfish. But that, yeah. I, th- I think that's that's my goals right now, and I just want to get the kayak out because I, I literally just got it like last week. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just getting you know getting it up and ready and geared up. So um, I tell you, man, that the kayak fishing is it's really a blast for people that haven't done that. Um, it's just different, you know, from a boat. And I love fishing from a boat as much as the next person, but. Um, you know, if you've not <clears throat> drifted for a catfish in a kayak and had a takedown in the kayak, it's just, it's a pretty cool feeling. I know uh, Kit's been doing a lot of the blue cat stuff down there in Kansas, you know, yeah. the last year or so. And it's just, it's just different, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's when you're, you're sitting there and all of a sudden that rod has been over, it's out of nowhere and you're, you're going to reach for it and you're battling it and you're, you're sitting there in the kayak fighting it. Um, and even, you know, last year I took a couple of buddies out and we went through the backwater ponds in that creek that goes into Cottonwood. And we went on the Des Moines River right there and, and went on a sandbar and just, you know, shored up our kayaks and, and anchored fish right there off the sandbar. And it's just, it's a cool experience if you've not kayak fished. You know, it's, I think that's something people should, should do and, and just say they've done it. It's, it's a pretty cool feeling. Agreed. Yeah, I think it's the best. It's it's probably my favorite way of fishing, honestly. It's it's not because you know we we're talking about that kid, right? Like it, it, you don't necessarily catch more fish, but something about catching a fish when it's like right under you, next to you, or when it pulls you, because you know the difference between you know a bank bank fishing or even on a boat. When you're on a boat, it's not pulling the whole boat. You know what I'm saying? It's like. But when you're on a kayak, you you feel every ounce of power that fish has. You know, even if it's a small crappie, if you're on that mm-hmm. kayak, it, it still pulls you. So I think, to me, that's that that's the biggest thing. I, I mean, I love about the kayak thing. It's just like it's just so different for some reason. Especially, yeah. especially for catfish. I mean, when you're just sitting there and you're kind of chilling, you've got the right wind. You know, you're just kind of drifting. You've got a couple of rods set out. And then all of a sudden they just buckle over and you've got an eight, nine pound channel cat on there. It's just, it's cool. You know, and it's, it's a, it's a fun experience. If you're in a good day where it's, you know, one after the other, you just keep doing that rinse and repeat. It's a good time. Yeah. Yeah. By far, it's my favorite, favorite way to target like blues and channel cats. What's your, what's your goal, Kit? You asking all us, man. What's your oh, goal? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my goals are not too, not too um, crazy. I don't think they're not too crazy anyway i i put some arbitrary number uh for a, for a 30 pound blue catfish in the kayak and i want to catch my first striped bass Ooh, we this go. year we got where are you where are you gonna go to do that at? exactly um uh, uh the ocean would be an obvious <laughs> answer but uh but uh, I'm, I'm gonna go for a freshwater like a landlocked striped bass because it's uh 
I could drive um, six, seven hours. What's know, the closest? I mean, I'm just curious. What's the closest spot that would have? Is it would it be like a South, right, Kitten? Or um, there's a there's a few lakes in Kansas, and then if you go south, like Arkansas, maybe okay. uh, some places in Missouri. Okay. Um, yeah, but it they're like you know weekend trip doable. It's doable. Hmm. Hey, let me know. I'll take the I'll take the family. We'll, we'll just get a cabin. See, I think one of one of my trips I want to do this year. I want to go to a, like a a, fish, a a lake with striped bass, and then on my way back hit another lake, catch blue catfish, and then just head on home. But Man. I think I think the blue I think the lakes with the striped bass also have also have a blue cat, so I could probably knock them all out in one lake. So I did you- get a thirty I did get a thirty two pound blue last uh, last summer down there with uh, Jason was STL St Louis catfishing so. Oh yeah, I, you did. I, yeah, I did experience that. So that was that was a lot of fun. Dude, I bet I'm I'm so jealous when I saw those pictures. Like, oh man, but I <laughs> want to do it in a kayak. So I'm yeah. I'm just I don't know, kayak kayak fishing. It's not easy. You don't do it because it's easier than like bank fishing or boat fishing. Um, one maybe. of uh, one of my favorite videos actually to show the kids at the high school level is um spencer's blue cat from i don't even know how long it's been now it's, it's probably been a few years where i don't even know i don't think he even got the weight on that massive thing but where he had it buckled over and he had the, the rod look like he was i mean he was up against the kayak and he was sitting there holding it with the two hands and i don't remember where, where he was for that trip but they watched that one and that's always a good shock value um i, I love those big fish man coming up you know it's like you said kit in the kayak it's it's crazy yeah, it's just close quarters, and you're you're at the fish's mercy, especially when you're talking catfish. Um, even even like channel cats, you know they they put up a dang good fight. Spin your kayak around, mm-hmm. and ten pound catfish will put put a pretty good fight in the kayak. Or even those flatties, you know, right there in the log jams, you know, with you got oh, yeah. to on or something. See, that's that's something I haven't done. Maybe that should be another goal. Maybe that's my third goal. I think. Blue cats first, thirty pound blue cat, striped bass, and then uh, flathead in the kayak. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I just love watching, uh, you know, other people's videos and stuff. And uh, I've seen a couple where Denny Ransom is is uh, almost like almost like vertical jigging, you know, over a log pile storm, and it's just crazy to watch that. And all of a sudden, the fish is on, and you're just like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's just really cool. Yeah, agreed. We got we got to get you uh, go kayak fishing with us. We gotta go together. Yeah. All of us yeah. sometimes. We gotta do something. We gotta set, we'll set something up in a couple. I'm still a purist and go with the oars, man. I'm still a purist. I'm I'm not that new age. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, man. No. Well, so what, what do you think about a pedal kayak with life scope on there? Is that is that too much or what? <laughs> right. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do, man. I mean, <laughs> whatever whatever makes you feel uh, confident, you know, to catch those fish. Yeah, I, I can't let that life scope just sit there waiting for the ice. So I, I gotta put it to use. I get my money's worth. No, I feel you on that. All right, so well, yeah, we can set something up. We can we can go somewhere local or something somewhere nearby. We can do something, and we can see we can make it a little competition, like you know, live scope versus the you know the rest of the guys who oh. doesn't <laughs> see who wins. Oh. Uh, every time, every time I bring it out and like fish against people, for some reason, uh, I don't do very good. <laughs> I haven't hit my stride with the live scope yet. The one tough thing I feel like. Um... The, the little bit of that learning curve is kind of like with a camera when you first, cause I use pan optics. Um, I'm, I'm the old school now cause I have pan optics. So I'm like old <laughs> age cause I have that. But I feel like you, uh, when you first start using it, you spend more time watching the screen than actually like actively fishing. Just like with a camera, you get so fixated on seeing what's down there. You're like, Oh, that's cool. Did you just see that musky swim by, you know, you'll be up at clear Lake and fish, uh, fish for perch. All of a sudden a big old musky, swims by and all of a sudden you're not even paying attention to actually trying to fish you're just sitting there watching stuff and i feel like i've done that with pan optics before where i'm just sitting there kind of looking around and all of a sudden it's like 15 minutes later it's like oh shit i should probably start fishing yeah yeah that's the same that's the same routine i get into i'm i'm so busy like looking at stuff opposed to just fishing i can't wait to get out on some like like mid lake points like fish some underwater point that white bass or wipers all screwed up in and then just I, I i'm gonna call it sniping them off of that point with live scope that's goal number four 
<laughs> Jeez, a lot of goals, man. Goals aren't goals. Goals aren't bad as long as they're reasonable. Very now, true. Now, what uh, what have you guys have you guys been out at all this spring, or what uh, what kind of fishing are you guys doing right now? Go ahead, Gortz. I haven't done. Shit. <laughs> Sorry, I literally just put my ice stuff probably away uh, three weeks ago. For man, nah, not even yeah, but three weeks ago, um, I honestly had been working to try to get the kayak, you know, to finally get the one kayak that I wanted to upgrade to, and then like, yes, I got it, and it was just maybe a week. Last week I picked it up, and then now I got to get all the gear up and stuff ready for it. So I haven't even been out. Um, I know obviously just by Facebook, <laughs> I can see that a lot of shore fishermen are catching fish. So I need to get out there. Um, but I, I do plan after I have a family trip this weekend, I do plan to get out there hopefully within the next, after this weekend, I'm definitely going to get out there as soon as I can, uh, at least shore fish for now, but then I'm definitely get that yak as soon as possible. But I think you've been, you've been out a few times since ice out though, right kid? Um, I've. I've tried the ice out cats thing. Uh, didn't go so well. I've been walleye fishing plenty of times. That hasn't been going good either. <laughs> uh, I've taken the kayak out a few, a couple times. And eh, it's so-so. Uh, so basically to sum it up, my, my fishing this spring has been so-so. I did, a, I did that one blue cat trip. Uh, caught three blue cats over the weekend. I did uh, catch, catch a pretty decent amount of crappies. And that was my first time using the live scope on the kayak. Like uh, we fished some boat docks and just seeing like pointing it towards the boat docks, even though, you know, the wind's blowing me around, just getting a glimpse of what's under there is like, oh, there's fish under there. So, I, you know, after being blown away from the wind, I go back, just cast in, boom, bite. I was like, all right, this is it. And then uh, the second time I went out was uh, with the kayak again, and it wasn't so good. <laughs> a different set of docks different lake uh, i think it's just too early yeah i think it was just too early the fish aren't pushed up in there yet but i, th I think it, i'm probably was a week early i bet if i go this week it is nice when uh you have that first live scope or pan optics experience where it feels like you validated yourself for having purchased it <laughs> Because there's there's times I've gone I've gone on a couple of ponds uh, ice fishing, and I just wouldn't I wouldn't bust it out because it almost felt like cheating. Um, and so we'd fish for a while, you know. With when I say old school, you know, the Vexies and stuff or the Markhams, and and after a little bit of a dry spell, it's like okay, I'll bust out, you know, the pen optics, and you put it down. It's like all right, 50 feet that way, and then you start you punch those holes, and then like two seconds later, you're pulling a fish, you're like. Okay, I guess I guess it, it does work, you know. Like, so like, this is why I bought this. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like that's why I spent that kind of money on that. Is it, you guys feel it's a game changer? Yeah, uh, it like it depends on the type of fishing. Like honestly, um, with cat fishing, I don't think it makes that big of a difference. Okay, because uh, you're not you're not really casting towards catfish. Like you're, I'm not using it to like look for catfish. Like oh, there's a catfish over there. I'm gonna throw my, throw my freaking shad towards it. True. No, that makes sense. So. Yeah, I like. I feel like for panfish and for structure, um, it's it's really nice because you can scan it on a piece of structure and see those fish around it and what they're holding tight to. Because mm -hmm. um, there is there's times even where if you're in a, a body of water that doesn't have a ton of structure you might see a school of fish, you know, 50 feet away, but by the time you go over and punch, they're scattered, you know? And, and so there's time where it's not, it's not like an automatic, oh, hey, there's fish, you go over there, punch it, they're just going to sit tight for you. Um, I, I feel like when you can see the structure though, I, I do think it is still quote unquote a game changer if you want to break down a lot of water quickly, you know, mm. and not spend but I feel like if you've got a body of water where you know what you want to do, you know what you're targeting, um, it's not probably as pertinent to have it there. Right. Yeah. If you're trying to look for a, like a particular piece of structure, let's say a brush pile. Yeah. It's, it's so easy with the live scope because, yeah. you know, you know, it's in the general area and all you got to do is just drill a hole, just start pointing around, you know, 
100 feet this way, 100 feet that way, opposed to the old school way, you know, you'll drill like, I don't know, 20 holes in different directions and start poking around until you find it. Very it's true. just, yeah, just, just finding structure. I think that's the biggest thing. And I haven't experienced it yet, but like, I think I see people like when they spider rig with crappies and they have life scope and they just chase the schools around. Good. I mean, just, I think that's good for uh, people who are thinking about it or who don't know too much about it, about live scope. They hear about it and they just see the price tag. They're like, Whoa, is this going to guarantee me catch fish? But like what you guys just said, it just depends on the application and how you use it, I guess. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And I don't know, Kit, what you would say, but in, in using pan optics myself and seeing, you know, several of my buddies use live scope, it, it's not, I, I don't think it's a tool that just any angler or a casual fisherman can just grab and, and go out on a body one and go, I can read this and I'm going to catch fish because mm -hmm. there is a learning curve in getting it dialed into the settings you like, the gain, uh, to the trails to separate all the, you know, the fish from the clutter and, and stuff like that. So it's not like a, a Vexi where you're just going to, you know, turn it on and like, Oh, I see the bottom. Oh, I see fish. That's easy. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. I totally agree. Cause I, I was in these, um, these Garmin life scope groups and every day it's like, what's the best settings? What's the best settings? <laughs> like, you know, my, my unit's doing this or I can't see this, you know, what do I need to do? People are okay. always asking questions, you know, what's, what's the magic setting. And the thing is, there is no magic setting. You're, you're always fiddling and tweaking because from one body of water to the next, you know, the like water clarity makes a big difference. Or if there's like a bunch of, um, was it like plankton or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, stuff that interferes with it too because you know it can see all those little things and there's there's what like there's gain the tvg noise rejection they're just more things to fine tune but once you fine tune it it works pretty good but that also means there's a lot of things there's a lot of variables that go with it yeah no makes sense um just wondering are, are you doing are you building off of the YouTube thing too, Derek? Are you going to be um, doing more on the channel? I mean, you got a lot going on. You, you got the, yeah, the Facebook group, like I you're do. saying, that's you're busy there. And then you also got, now you got the guide service that, you know, and, and then you got the YouTube thing. How the hell are you doing all that? It's a lot um, of work. Yeah. The YouTube thing is more when I get time and I want to do a quick video. I, I by mm -hmm. no means have the right gear to do that in a serious fashion. And I don't know that I have the desire. I, I think <laughs> the guys like, you know, like Kit and, and Spencer and all, and all those guys, um, it, it's a different, it's a different thing, you know, when you want to do it um, and do it seriously, um, not only the gear and the setup, but the frequency. And I don't know, you know, what Kit feels like, but I, I, I got to imagine there's a little bit of a pressure with that. Once you start churning out content, to keep that pace, um, you know, cause once you get people in that, that demand of material, there's that pressure to keep doing more and Hey, what's next. And, and just constant ideas and generating things. You know, um, I think for me on the YouTube side of things, it's more about like, what are some simple setups or techniques that I can show that maybe people don't think about, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe somebody's never done a slip bobber rig and I can show them how this is how I set up a slip bobber. Or if I'm doing a, a Lindy rig for walleye, that's something that's a little secret for people that don't do it out of big rig, little Lindy rig action. Uh, <laughs> if, if you don't do that, Hey, here, here's a video of my setup, you know? Um, so stuff like that. I'll, I'll use that for those, those opportunities, but uh, no, I, I don't know. It, it is always trying new things and it is a lot to try and manage. And like I said, we'll, we'll see how the guiding thing goes. I just, I've had enough people over the last few years kind of ask me casually about it that it's like, well, all right, let's, let's see what happens and give it a shot. I'm going to touch on the YouTube thing <laughs> uh, this week. I missed my video for today because well, this week I've been going in at work at three or I've been waking up at three in the morning, coming home at like three or four. And then this is our third podcast three days in a row. It's like, Oh man, I do. I have, do I like, I, I need like a little break like from work and the podcast so i squeeze in a nap and then i'm like ah oh, i don't want to edit a video but i was i was probably i was still i'll still squeeze one out but i i was on a pretty consistent schedule uh for i think a, about a year now i was like hitting one video every week set schedule and 
I'm kind of disappointed in myself. I, I uh, broke from that schedule because once once you've established a schedule, you know, pe people have an expectation. Uh, I think my audience, they're small enough and dedicated enough where they're not like, oh, he this guy didn't upload a video on Wednesday at 3 p.m. I'm going to I'm leaving. Hey, you want yeah. some cheese with that wine, dude? Come on, man. <laughs> dude, I come on. <laughs> You're OK. I'll, I'll give it to you. You're right. We, we had a rough week. But man, just imagine if you had kids, man. God, see, join my world. I'm doing the same with you. Hello. <laughs> I had to do all the damn podcasts and I had to work and I had dark kids, <laughs> man. But you're right. It Let's... takes time to edit. So a lot of people don't realize you're right. No, it, well, it, it, to it, film it. and then edit. Yeah, the film and then edit and then film something that's worth editing. That's the, and the yeah. And then that's... you don't always edit everything you film. That's, true. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Right. So, no, well, I, I, get I get it. it. I just give you a hard time, man. <laughs> Thinking about hours, the hours of film that you guys go through and cut and stuff like that. And it's just, I don't know. It's a lot of work and I appreciate, you know, that you guys do that stuff, but it's definitely not for everyone. That, that's for sure. And I think the one big thing for me um, that probably won't ever change is I don't ever want to do something that's going to take away my enjoyment of fishing. You know, I, I still do fishing um, as an activity, as a passion that I want to do. And I still want that to be the focus. Um, so once I start doing something that takes away from that, I, I don't, I don't want to continue doing that. Right. Yeah. Makes I mean, I, I'm, I'm not complaining that I got to make YouTube videos or anything. Yeah. I got to go fishing today, guys. God, this sucks. But no, I get it. No, I was just wondering because, man, I don't know how the heck you would be able to do all that and edit and, you know what I'm saying? Do the guide service, which, um, that's cool. I, 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 I give you props on that because to, to start a guide service and, and to even jump into that realm, man, I mean, I, I don't even know what it would take in regards to skill set of knowing scouting and all that stuff. Cause that's even more, more, more work. You know yep. what I mean? That, I think it's more work than actually taking somebody fishing because you have to know the timing, the spot, the location, because, you, you know, that you've already obviously been to and, and, and know what species of fish to catch. So that's why I think guide service is like, that's tough. Yeah, I'll get you know, yeah somebody's paying you. So there's a yeah. certain expectation that's, there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I hear you. That's, that's... Just be like, um, I don't... <laughs> I don't guarantee fishes. I just guarantee a good time. <laughs> That's what Spencer Actually, said. <laughs> this, this might be something that um, other guides would frown upon. I don't know. Um, but I do have a skunk rate um, because I, 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 here's the deal. I, I'm honest with myself, you know, and I realize that there's going to be, there's going to be tough days and there's going to be times where people want a specific fish, you know, like, Hey, I want to go out for walleyes and that's just what I want to do. Let's go walleye fishing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to be point blank and say, Hey, we can do that. And I'm going to bust my ass for you for the time that we're out there, but I can't guarantee it, you know? And so I, I did put a little caveat. There is a skunk rate on there for people, you know, to, Hey, take a risk and, and come out and let's have a good time. And I'll, I'll cut you a deal. Um, I mean, could, could you argue that that hurts me long run? Yes, but I'm not doing this for a living. You know, it's, it's more just to, another opportunity for people if they want to spend the money to do that, to go out and, and maybe learn something and hopefully catch a fish while they're out or 20, you know, that'd be nice. Yeah, or, or 20, 20 would be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, man. Is that, is that a things guide services do or is that, where, yeah, where did, where did that, where does that come from? The scout um, thing? I, I, it came up from, so what I do every open water season and every winter season, I go on a trip. And every time I go on a trip, I go with a different guide. So I've been to Devil's Lake. I've been to Mille Lacs. I've been to Lake of the Woods. I've, I've been to Milwaukee. I've gone to a lot of these places. And anytime I go, I hire a guide, you know, and every single one is a little bit different, you know, and the memories are a little bit different. Um, and so I think it, it is just something to me that felt like was important um, because I feel like no matter what, when somebody's going on a guided trip, there's ex there's expectations and there's hope, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're going out with somebody and you're you're hopeful. Um, and the fact of the matter is, there's times where it it just doesn't work out. And rather than somebody feel like they wasted time, I, I want them to feel like I 
I will do my best, but I want to work with you kind of thing. And I think that's where it came from. Cause I, I've had some tough trips, you know, I've gone to some destination lakes and, and fish with some of the top notch dudes. And I don't want to, I don't want to name names and, you know, you know, discredit them, but there's times where we've had rough outings and, and I get, you know, it's fishing is fishing, you know, and you get that, but you kind of leave going, well, shit. you know, I, I feel kind of bad. I just drove 10 hours and paid 300 bucks and got, you know, less than I would have got back home, mm-hmm. you know, with fishing with like one of the top names in the industry. So I don't know. I, I think it came from that and just going to a lot of places and fishing with a lot of people. I, f- I feel like people like us that fish, you know, more than just on the weekends or whatever, they, they, they're more understandable, but like your casual, like let's say your casual client, you know, they're, they're, I bet their expectations are going to be like way up here yep. opposed to like, you know, me or you, like we know, you know, fishing's not always, you're, you know, you're not always knocking them dead and, you know, guys yeah. have bad days too. We get yeah. it, but yeah. Well, that's one of the things I'm, I'm doing too, if not doing a specific species, um, because I do think that makes it a little bit easier when you're doing just, you know, just crop or you're just cats or whatever people know what they're signing up for. And so <clears throat> prior to doing a trip, I, I have kind of like a questionnaire or a survey that I do with them um, just to get a true idea of what is it that you're wanting out of this trip? Are you wanting to just go for one really nice fish? Are you wanting just to take some kids out and catch some bluegills and have a good time and not have to, you know, constantly bait a hook, <laughs> you know? So different people have different expectations and, and different things they want out of, out of fishing. Definitely. That's, I mean, no, you guys are, you're, you're, you guys are spot on in regards to that. Cause if you don't look, if I was going to pay for a guide service, I got my kids and my family to take them. Yeah. I'm going to have an expectation. Now. I want to catch a lot of fish, but you guys are right. It's just not, you just don't know, man. That's why they call it fishing. Mm-hmm. It's not called well, catch. And I, I think the other thing for me, and I, and I don't want to, cause central Iowa is great. I mean, there's, there's a lot of nice fish here. Don't get me wrong, but it's not, it's not the same level of going up to devil's lake, right? Like, it's just not, not the same. Um, and I, I feel like I'm just trying to be honest with myself and with the, the people that, you know, might go out with me that this is not, <laughs> uh, you know, prime fishing location. Um, is there nice fish? Yeah. Can we find some fish? Yeah. My, I guess my ultimate goal, and I, I learned this from, from David Weiner when I went catfishing with him is my goal is just to teach uh, that person something that they can then use in the future when they fish on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anybody is interested in going cat fishing for channel cats and, and, and wants to learn how to do that effectively, David Weiner is fantastic. I mean, the whole time you're out there with him, um, he, he teaches you what he's doing, why he's doing it and what to look for. And no, Dave did not pay me to say that tonight. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that was something that had kind of a lasting impact in fishing with a lot of different guides and stuff. There's, there's been times where I fish with guides, they get you on a spot, they get you out there. They say, Hey, this is the, the go-to stuff. Um, and they say, good luck. You know, <laughs> this is, this is where it's been. I hope you knock them dead. And if they don't, Hey, it was, you know, it was just a tough bite. Um, and, and sometimes that kind of leaves you with a sour taste in your mouth. Uh, but when I know, I can leave whether I catch fish or not, but I can use that technique in the future and not fish doing it. That that's kind of like a return on investment for me. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of my goal, I guess, when I, when I take people out. Great segue because we did have David Weiner on our podcast a couple of weeks ago. So make sure you're listening to this podcast. You listen to this far, go back and listen to our episode that we did with David a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Get an in-depth uh, of what uh, Derek's talking about from the, yeah. from the man himself. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Um, man, this is, I, I had a blast so far, man. Um, it's, it's kind of cool to have a local presence uh, for us. I mean, I, I I, you know, I was talking to Fishy Kid about this, like a lot of our guests, I think we, we want to have more local guests. I mean, yes, we have, you know, we had a, a lot of YouTube stars and everything, but um, the, it, it just, to us, it feels like the local guests bring something more to us. You know, it feels, it feels that way, I guess, in a way. So uh, thank you so much, Derek, man. I mean, um, Kit, you got anything else for Derek uh, before we let him go? I mean, he's uh, fun. Yeah, so if uh, if any if any of our listeners want to get a hold hold of you, 
know, how do they do that? And you know, you want to make any announcements about your guide or just, you know, just stay tuned or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'll probably send out some more information here about the guiding itself on the group page. Um, if they want to contact me about that, they can email me at 515 fishing guides at gmail.com fishing. And then another G guides, um, at gmail.com. If you're not a member of the 515 fishing group on Facebook, check it out. Um, I feel like we've got uh, a really nice group and some pretty unique things to offer. Maybe, uh, that I don't want to say set us apart, you know, cause it is not a competition. And I feel like we, we collaborate a lot with the other local groups, but, um, I do feel like we provide a lot of cool opportunities on the group. Um, we're doing a swap meet here, um, in a couple weekends on the 25th, uh, where we barter trade gear, uh, people can bring their gear, barter and trade and stuff and, and even buy stuff. So, um, check that group out. Um, Otherwise, I just want to thanks, guys. Uh, say thank you for letting me come on tonight and chat a little bit about fishing. I always appreciate getting the chance to talk fishing. It's a good time. Nah, it's been fun, man. And and you know what? I actually, kind of, I'm glad you mentioned. Make sure you guys do join the five one five group. And I'm talking to a lot of our listeners. We have listeners in Hawaii. We have listeners in Canada, California, uh, Northeast, East Coast, everything. Uh, join it. The reason being, cause I know you guys are listening cause you guys might want to come to Iowa one day and you might as well join that group. When you come visit us, when you're, dri- okay, this is the thing you're driving or whatever. And you come across Iowa, you like, you know what? I got my fishing pole in the back, whatever. If you're in that group, you can obviously ask anybody. And, you know, I'm just saying you get, they might be able to get you on a high bite, bite of some sort, oh, right? There you go. There you go, guys. So other than that, man, thank you so much, Derek. Appreciate it. Uh, can't wait do it again and then you know what best of luck to you on the guide service and everything man all right thank you fellas appreciate it yeah thank you derek